so let's try our, our hat at a few more multiple choice questions. So as I go through each of these, again, I'm gonna really try and focus on what is the variable in this problem. So as we look at this, it says a kennel club argues that 50% of dog owners in its area own golden retrievers, 40% own shepherds of one kind or another, and 10% own a variety of other breeds. A random sample of 50 dogs from the area turns up data on the following table. So I see some observed data here. I'm just gonna take note that I see one row of observed data and it's telling me to run a chi-squared test. So this is gonna be a goodness of fit test. All right, I have 50 dogs and let's think about what variable I'm looking at here. Um, I am keeping track not of their age or their weight, but rather what breed they are. So the variable in this problem is dog breed, right? So I'm gonna say, I see this variable is dog breed. Another thing I noticed is that I was given some proportions. I know I'm in proportion land. All right, prop land. I have three categories in this problem. So I'm gonna run a chi-squared test. Okay, so this is a version where I gave you the three null proportions. I'm not assuming there's 33.3% golden retrievers, 33.3% shepherds, and 33.3% others. And if you're wondering where am I getting 33%, I'm just saying this is not the version where I take 100% and divide it by the number of categories I have. I gave you specific 50%, 40%, 10%. So my null here would be that the proportion of golden retrievers is 50%. The proportion of shepherds is 40%. And the proportion of others, whatever that is, is 10% against the alternate that H naught is not true. Right? Something's off in those hypothesized proportions. So let's go figure out what the chi-squared test statistic is. Um, in order to do that, I need all of the expected counts. So let's get the expected golden retrievers, and that's always NP. So in this case, I had 50 dogs times my null proportion of 50%. So I expected 25 golden retrievers. Okay, well, I saw 27, so that's pretty close. Let's see how many shepherds I expected. This would be NP, so this would be 50 times, what was our null, 40%. So I would have expected 20 shepherds, and I saw 22, that difference isn't too much. And then let's see, if I, for the others, this would be NP, this would be 50 times 10%, and that would be five, great. All of these are greater than or equal to five, so I can run this chi-squared test. And it's asking me for the test statistic, and I'm, I'm gonna kind of run out of room here, but again, I'll, I'll I'll squinch it in here. This would be the sum of the observed minus expected squared over expected. And I'm gonna have my calculator do this for me. So let me clear out my lists. And I'm gonna do this the TI-83 way because I don't wanna assume that you have an 84. So I will put my observes in L1, my expecteds in L2, and let's go see what our chi-squared test statistic is. I need to add up all the observed minus expected squared. So that's gonna be L1 minus L2 squared. Divide that by L2. There are all of my, what's the vocab term? Contributors, right? So I got a contributor of these three numbers and I'm gonna add those up. So I'll hit second in stat, go over to math, hit L3, and it looks like my chi-squared test statistic in this case is 3.56. Now, again, if you had the 84 method, it goes so much faster. I mean, I wish we all had it, but if I've got the goodness of fit test, um, I actually, I did have two degrees of freedom. I'll hit calculate and there it is. And if you scroll right and left, you can see those three contributors. You see 0 0.16, 0 0.2, and 3.2. And for those of us on the TI-83, those were the three numbers in L3, okay? So there's, there's example six, got it done, right? Chi-squared goodness of fit test statistic. If you got the TI-84s, it's a matter of putting your observed into L1, calculating your expecteds and putting them into L2 and then running the test, okay? 
All right, so let's take a look at example seven. Let's try and figure out what is the variable in this problem. All right, so what is varying? So here we go. A die was rolled 24 times. All right, so it looks like I've got 24 trials here with the following results. So it looks like um, the face with one came up twice. I rolled a two, eight times, three, two times, so on and so forth. So this is the face of the dots, right? Here's some frequencies. All right, so just take note, right? We have frequencies. All right, a chi-squared goodness of fit, excuse me, a goodness of fit chi-squared test is to be used to test the null that the die is fair. At a significance level of 1%, the value of the chi-squared test statistic and the decision reached is, okay, so it looks like I need the test statistic and then whether or not I'm gonna reject or fail to reject the null based on this alpha of one. So we wanna be careful here. I am in prop land, all right, because the variable here is the, the face of the die. So it's the die or dice face. I don't know how you would, um, I would just say die, no, I guess dice. I'm not great with my plurals when it comes to that. So the dice face, and it might seem like the variable is numerical because you're seeing one, two, three, four, five, six here but the variable is just categorical, right? Again, they represent an area, a geographical area, a face of the dice. It's just like quadrant one, two, three, four, where we saw on a previous multiple choice question. I get that they have numbers on here, but they could just as well have had symbols, right? I could have had a triangle, a rectangle, a square, a trapezoid, a circle, I don't know, a semicircle. And it's just a matter of, did they come up the same amount of times or different amounts of times, right? We wanna see if this dice is fair. So taking note here, I'm in prop land. I have that categorical variable, plus anytime you see frequencies, it's like a red flag that you're gonna convert it over to relative frequencies and be in proportion land. My variable is the dice face, right? So I have six categories, one for each side of that of that die, so I'm gonna go chi-square. Now, my null, if the die are fair, then the proportion of ones, twos, and I'll go dot, 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 just to reiterate that, to sixes should be equal, and they should specifically be equal, if we take a look, to 100 divided by six, which is about 16.67%, so I'm gonna write here 0.167. Then depending on how you round it, if you could go 0 0.1667, 0 0.17, you might have numbers just slightly off from mine. Okay, that's all fine and good. Here are my observed. I need to calculate my expected, all right? So again, my alternate will be H naught is not true, right? So not fair dice. And just looking at it, it might not be fair. Look, it looks like I'm rolling twos and sixes a lot, right? Now, the sample size is pretty small. So it's hard to say if it's a fair dice or not, but we're gonna run the hypothesis test and see what we think. Because all of the null proportions are equal, I should expect the same, the same numbers for my expected counts. So the expected number of ones will equal the expected number of twos, will equal the expected numbers of three, four, fives, and sixes. They're all gonna be n times p, so it's 24 times 0.167. Okay, let's see. So I'll do 24 times 0.167, and we're getting pretty close to four, and that would be the actual, the four would be the legit number, because imagine if I did 24 times this 100% divided by six, right? It would actually be four. So this should be that if I'm gonna roll this 24 times and everything's fair, I should get four ones, four twos, threes, fours, five, sixes. Each of these should have been the number four. And if you're looking at it, it shows that none of them were the number four. But again, it's only 24 die rolls, so the, we're so far away from the law of large numbers kicking in, it's kind of hard to tell. All right, so with all of that, let's go figure out what we're going to do. All right, so I'm gonna clear out my lists. I'm gonna do this the TI-83 way, and then I'll show you with the TI-84. All right, so my observed, are these numbers and my expected are a bunch of fours. Oops. All right, so here we go. I need to do observed minus expected squared divided by expected. 
All right, there are my contributors. Let's add these numbers up. And it looks like my chi-squared test statistic is 12.5. Okay, so I'll just take note of that. It's 12.5, so I'm gonna rule out C, and I'm gonna rule out D. Now, if I'm on the TI 83, for my p-value, which is what I need so I can make my decision, I'm gonna do the probability that chi-squared is greater than 12.5, because we always have a right-tailed test with chi-squareds. So I'm gonna run chi-squared CDF, low, high, and I had, oops, it moved my paper. I had six categories, so I'm gonna have five degrees of freedom. So let's see what our p-value would have been. So we'll go chi-squared, so let me get this into view, chi-squared, where is it? CDF, 12.5, positive infinity, and what did we have? Five degrees of freedom. So it looks like my p-value is around 3%. All right, so I'm just gonna abbreviate or write 0.03 here. Okay, so at the 1% alpha level, this time my p-value is actually greater than alpha, right? So I'm really gonna scrunch this in here. So my p-value is greater than alpha, so we fail to reject H naught here. Huh, all right. So fail to reject the null, that would be A. So I don't have enough evidence to actually say this is trick die yet. And that's why um, you saw me hesitating because 24 times, it's just not that many observations. Um, and, and if you look, like my expected counts, it was four. I haven't even hit the expected count equaling five. So the deal breaker assumption hasn't even been met. There just wasn't an option saying I shouldn't have done this. It's just basically saying that your sample size, it's just not large enough to really run a legit test. If you're gonna run it, you're gonna fail to reject the null, but you really should just up your, your trials before you run your hypothesis test because we haven't even hit that deal breaker assumption. All right, so let's take a look at example eight. Okay, so we're moving through this. Oh, let me get this whole thing in view, there we go. All right. So it says, in a study to compare movie preferences among different age groups, a chi-squared statistic was used. If a small value of the test statistic is obtained, it suggests that, and then we have a bunch of options. So this is saying I have a small value for chi-squared. So chi-squared, my step 10 number, is small. All right, so whatever step 10 is, I got a small number. Now keep in mind, and I'll, I'll write it over here, Chi-squared, it's always this ratio or the sum of these contributors that have these ratios of observed minus expected squared over expected. So let's, let's see what happens. If you have a small value of your test statistic, the null hypothesis may not be rejected since the differences between the observed and expected values are relatively large. Okay, the null hypothesis may be rejected since the differences between the observed and expected values are relatively large. So we have, if I look at the difference between A and B, we have may not be rejected, may be rejected, and these differences are large. All right, the null hypothesis may not be rejected since the differences between the observed and expected are really small. The null hypothesis may be rejected since the differences between the null, excuse me, the observed and expected are relatively small. So it looks like I have to figure out here, where my difference is large or small, and then based on that, am I gonna reject or not reject the null? Okay, so let's, let's start to think about this. This is saying this number is small, and you're adding a bunch of fractions, right? So to obtain a small, or yeah, to obtain a small test statistic, then the contributors must also be small, and these individual expressions are the contributors. Adding them up is what gets us our, our overall chi-squared test statistic. So each contributor is a fraction. And there are two ways to get a fraction to be small. It's either that the numerator is small or the denominator is large. But let's, let's focus on this first one, if the numerator is small. So if this is a small number, right? If our numerators are small, that would mean that the difference between the observed and the expected are also small, right? So I'm gonna say it again, if this fraction is small, one option is that the numerator is small. 
And if your numerator is small, then your observed minus expected should be a small number. And we actually saw that way back in example one, the very, very first example we did, we had a small contributor from the macadamia nuts. And let me, let me refer you back to that. I know it's been a little while. So if we remember, we were looking at um, a random sample of nuts to determining what type of nut they had. Remember that we had, we observed 20 macadamia nuts and we expected 19.5. Those were really small numbers. And we found out that that contributor there was really, really small as well, right? It was a pretty teeny number because this numerator was only 0.5. Yes, we were squaring it, but then we were dividing it by 19.5. It was going to make it even smaller. Okay, so I'll say this again, right? If our numerators are small, that would mean the difference between the observed and the expected would be small as well. So if I look at these options, right? It's saying the differences between the observed and expected are relatively large. That's not true. Okay, so we, we've got it narrowed down to these, these differences would be relatively small. But a different way of saying that is saying that what we observed in our data is what we expected. All right? And we're calculating what we expected based on the null, right? So that would also mean that the null is likely to be true all right, but we don't actually say the null is true because you go into any hypothesis test saying the null is true. We would just say we fail to reject the null. So the correct answer here is C. If what you observed matches what you expect, then we think the null is true, or we would say we fail to reject it, okay? All right, so when we get back from here, we're gonna take a look at the next type of chi-squared test, the test for independence. All right, see you in a bit, bye.